Um, the other issue, um, apart from climate change and election and um, I guess, you know, why is it so expensive to build a home in New Zealand, uh, that will not go away. But, you know, hope, you just hope, will one day ele- end up as an election issue. And you hope that one day we'll actually understand that boys and men are just as important as girls and women is the huge amount of um, failure that seems to be projected upon young men, not just in New Zealand and the Western world. Boys are failing at school and boys are failing in our education system and boys are failing to go on to higher tertiary education and being denied in a number of specialist schools um, that are reliant upon academic marks to get in. I'm thinking of medicine, the law in particular the opportunity to fairly compete in those as well. The gender gaps uh, for tertiary graduates is now wider than it was in the 1970s, except it's actually the other way around these days. It wasn't men outstripping women, and it was men outstripping women in the 1970s. Today, it's entirely the other way around. Well, somebody else who is concerned about this and has delivered his latest um, evaluation of boys in our education system uh, it joins us again this morning is Elwyn Paul. Elwyn, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for joining us again. Thanks, Michael. All right. Um, the latest one that you've done now is to do with boys' schools with high reputations compared to boys in other schools in New Zealand. And what you've done is you've taken the super eight, as they call them, uh, it's mostly a sporting convention, but Hamilton Boys High, Napier Boys High, Hastings Boys High, I would never have regarded them as an academic school, Rotorua Boys High, Gisborne Boys, Tauranga, New Plymouth, Palmerston North, and compared their academic results with others in New Zealand, and they've been found wanting, yeah? Yeah, and, and one of the reasons for doing that is um, it, it's kind of a bit like for Māori education, uh, Manakura and Palmerston North pulls the rug out from everyone else because they produce such amazing results that you go, okay, it, it's the nature of how we teach, it's the nature of the school, it's not it's not the ethnicity of the child. And in this situation, you, you see uh, St. Peter's in Epsom, which, which is remarkably led by James Bentley, uh, incredible results, basically keep all of their kids there uh, until they're at least 17, uh, and then I included St. Paul's and Ponsonby because um, just four years ago, their results w- would have been just above um, the better of the Super 8 schools. And uh, a man called Kieran Fui moved from St. Peter's to St. Paul's and improved those results for UE believers by over 30% in just three years. Okay. Uh, and well, so, so again, it's saying it, it can be done. It's not. It's not that boys are boys. It's it's how we teach them, how we treat them. Okay. So, uh, you, you, uh, having a boy myself who is in year nine this year, Elwyn. So I've made my decision to do with his education. Um, I don't have access to a boys' school, which is where uh-huh. I would have sent my child, and a lot of people don't. There's a whole city in um, Wanganui doesn't have a boys' school. It's just a sh- tragedy. It's a scandal, actually. Yeah. But nevertheless, if I had a boy in Hawke's Bay, Gisborne, Rotorua, Tauranga, New Plymouth, Palmerston North, Hamilton, I do have a boys' school, and I would automatically think, because I've read all the figures, that a boys' uh-huh. school education delivers better than a co-ed school education for boys. Is that actually true? Yeah, it, it, it is. So um, we, we still have a situation in New Zealand where, uh, um, first of all, overall, you know, girls for uh, UE uh, are at 48% for leavers, boys at 34%, um, which is it's an enormous, enormous gap. So just give me that um, start again. So for UE for leavers... Yeah. Girls in New Zealand are at forty-eight percent. Yeah, so at forty-eight percent of all girls who've uh, who've gone mm-hmm. into that particular school will leave with UE. Is that what you're saying? Forty-eight percent of girls across New Zealand, yeah, uh, will come out of their secondary school with university entrance. Right. 
and only 34% of boys. Right. And so, so then if you look at it from a, a single-sex girl, single-sex boys co-educational, uh, the single-sex girl schools are about at 63%, the boys are around 48%, and co-ed is at 35 35 so did you say? So you do boys do better in single-sex boys school? The answer is yes. But I think what the data I sent out yesterday shows that they could be doing a whole lot better still. Um, uh, and should, should be doing a whole lot better still. Actually, I noticed ironically that of the eight Super 8 schools, the boys' schools in the centre of North Ireland, um, and Hamilton Boys High has actually done the best, I think it's the only one that's led by a woman. <laughs> that's true. Which is an irony, um, isn't it? Yes, um, and and you know those schools put an amazing amount of focus on onto their sport, uh, but but so you're Peter's suggesting pretty, possibly to the detriment of their academic ability. Um, I I do wonder whether there's still a, an amazing amount of categorisation going on. Like this 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 boy is a, a sporting boy. This boy is an academic boy. But I I don't I don't think that's holistic, and I'm. I, I'm I know Karen Phil and I know James Bentley and I know that they don't treat these students that way. Um, the other thing that strikes me from the statistics that you've done for boys' education um, in New Zealand is how prominently Catholic schools are outstripping mm-hmm. throughout the whole of New Zealand um, yes. uh, uh, non-Catholic uh, schools, whether they are integrated or, or, or state secondary schools. And that yes. sort of begs a question: Why have you? You must have answered that question, Owen. Well, I've I've, uh, I've I've talked to the people in those situations, and I mean, I think there's a few things. One is there's there's actually a lot of teamwork uh, in within the Catholic school, and um, they they support each other. It's it's um, you know seen to be a mark of what they do. Uh, to do well academically. I mean, you've got a girls' school like Macaulay in South Auckland, which is, you know, miles ahead of the rest. You've uh, got plenty of uh, um, both girls and boys' schools doing well. Um, and I think a lot of it is there's a, there's a simplicity to the approach. Uh, it's it's not complex. There are clear values uh, that, that are in place. Um, and the level of care just seems to be uh, fractionally, marginally, significantly higher depending on on the other schools that you're talking about. Um, I'm starting to think that religion is an aspect of this because religion forms, well, certainly the way in which this Christian religion is interpreted in those schools. Yeah. Religion forms a part of those schools. It's a pervasive part of the culture. And what seems to be, I mean, this is this is something that no woke people person will ever want to hear, or any atheist for this matter either. But it almost seems that the way in which Catholics think, in those schools at least, and the values that they inculcate, is now permeating through into academic attainment and achievement, which, when you think about it, is quite revelatory. Even if you're looking at, um, so, so I, I uh, went to Teachers College, I think 1990 in, in Christchurch, and one of the things that they just kept banging on about was that you weren't or you couldn't take a value position at, at any point of your teaching. And, um, you know, I thought at the time they were entirely wrong. Uh, even if you, you uh, I listed without without naming a faith or something like that, if you listed the key values of these schools, I think honesty and integrity and, and hard work and um, respect and, and good behaviour and manners and all of those things uh, are really significantly in place. Well, that's, you know, I think a lot of people who are baby boomers listening to this would go, well, of course, because what we're old-fashioned, traditional, um, is in actual fact proving to be why people succeed or fail. Yeah? Yeah, yeah totally agree. 
and, and um, you know, who, who you would want people with those value sets to work for you. So if, if you are a, a, a tradesman who's got an apprenticeship on offer, uh, you're obviously going to look at their qualifications, um, but you, you'll also notice where they've been to school and uh, the values that they bring with them. Yes, so, and I guess if I was a school teacher, I wouldn't go and teach at a Catholic school unless I actually embraced or at least associated myself in some way with the values that they inculcate, yeah? Yeah, so I, I think in some situations they, you know, depending, it, it, well, clearly if it was a RE, a religious education position, then you would be Catholic to attain that job in the school. Um, but in other situations, it, they are asking, uh, you know, are you empathetic uh, to the values, uh, comfortable with the values of the school and things like that? And so, yeah, um, there's, a, there's a checklist there. Is it all faith-based schools? And I'm talking about... No. Yeah? No, not, not entirely. So, I mean, obviously, Auckland Grammar School still does pretty well, although on these stats, it's below St. Paul's and Ponsonby, which I think is a bit of a stunner. Um, McLean's College, Rangitoto, uh, do pretty well uh, as, as, you know, two of our sort of major co-ed schools. Um, but, but, I mean, even, even on the girls' boys thing, so if you take each of those Super 8 schools and you match it to the girls' school in the same area, so Tauranga girls, Navy girls, that sort of thing, mm. in, in every situation uh, on these sort of UE for Libra's that. UE just has the highest school qualification, the, the aspirational one, if you like. In every one of those situations, uh, the girls' school directly. Mm. Mm. Um, somebody, I mean, there are people out there who hate school. I've just got a text here, which I'll share with you, because yes. it says, I'm turning off now. Honestly, I hated school. I've done well in life with no school. I hate it. See ya. And um, that sort of ignorance, um, you'd hate that kind of attitude to be inculcated to their children, wouldn't you? Yes, I think so. But also, but one of the things that's held us back for so very long is that we, we haven't seen failure in, in school as, as really being a problem. New Zealand-wide problem. Yeah. Because, you know, you've got, say, I'm going to say 65% now kids leave school. Well, probably not even that, but let's say, let's say 60, 65 leave school with uh, adequate to, to good outcome. And so they go, oh, well, you know, my kids are in that area. The fact that, that 40% are failing uh, won't affect, you know, me, my kids will do all right. But it affects everything. It affects everybody. It affects the, the, the tax that you pay. Mm. It affects the, the tone of the country. Mm. Um, it, it affects the, the services we can provide. And you can see it in... Yeah, the fact that we've got apparently low unemployment, but we've got 12% of able-bodied Aucklanders uh, not in education, training, or employment. Um, and, yeah, so it, what I think needs to be grasped, and it's incredibly ironic that I think New Zealand's worst Minister of Education in recent history is now our Prime Minister. <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense. But, what we as a country need to grasp is that this impacts everyone. Of course it does. Um, if you've got an ignorant population, you've got an ignorant country, and um, I think all those countries that have highly educated populations are generally at the top of the highest socioeconomic age, uh, levels, unless you discover oil. It seems to be the only exception. Um, well, and then a lot of those countries have used that to, to boost their education well, as well. Singapore is a good example of that. Uh, no natural yep. resources at all. Look at them. Um, now, the, the, interestingly, Shane's just pointed out, he says, well, McLean's College in Rangitoto, of course, have got high Asian populations. In yep. some ways, I guess that also buttresses the argument that culture, parents' culture, the culture of a school, is more important uh, a determinant of academic success than teaching. What do you think? I, I certainly think it's a... It's a a uh, very significant mix, um, but I'd never like to uh, offer up excuses. And uh, I mean, you and I both went to uh, Wanganui Boys College, 
uh, you know, they now achieve yearly for leaders at 1.4%. I know, it's a failed school. Um, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and, but, but there are a lot of those. And if you are prepared to take on leadership of a school uh, like that, et cetera, et cetera, then you've got to take on the responsibility to improve the outcomes for the children. And one thing I think would be uh, a, a very effective exercise is to take, there's only 410 or so secondary schools in New Zealand. Is to, you know, take, look at, say, okay, attendance, retention to 17, uh, and uh, I'd, I'd look for a measure of uh, parental connectivity, and then your outcome measures, and sit down each year and say, okay, how do we improve these all by uh, 5%, and what would that look like, and give the community something to get their teeth into. I guess, I guess, though, now that I'm thinking about it, one of the reasons there is this sort of anti-educationist or anti-intellectual feeling in New Zealand, particularly amongst men, is because they have yeah. failed in the schooling system. Yeah. So yeah. they don't value education and they won't pass that on to their children either, particularly their boys, if they're the father, because um, from their point of view, school made them fail. And um, they hold that resentment uh, certainly in their young adulthood and I guess ongoing in life. But it's sort of in a funny sort of way, but just as your point, doesn't it? We are failing our boys in the education system. You shouldn't be leaving an education system thinking that schooling's not for you. No, not at all. And, and uh, uh, it still uh, really strikes me, and I, know, I won't name the school in this case, um, but I was in a, I was in a school in a staff room uh, at the beginning of the year when they were going over the uh, results, in the big stage, it was it was bursary. And the head of science stood up. It was a boys' school. The head of science stood up and said, well, you know, our, our, our marks are ahead of the national average, and et cetera. And the head of math stood up and said the same thing. Then the head of English stood up and said, well, actually, our marks are behind the national average, but you must keep in mind we're teaching boys. Mm. And... and you know, my eyes nearly popped out of my head. And I managed, imagine going down the road to the matching girls' school and saying, you know, our science results are behind, but got to remember we're teaching girls. Mm. Where I would have been, you know, shocked. Mm. Mm. Um, but it's a really pervasive attitude. Uh, and you would think that there had been no men who'd ever written great books or... <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> or, or, you know, I mean, it's interesting you should talk. Just uh, just for the background of our listeners, um, you and I both went to Wanganu Boys College. What year, what was the last year you left there, Owen? 1984. 1984. So my last year was 10 years earlier than that. I, I left at 16, but there you go. Uh, I was, got pushed ahead at primary school of all places, Tawera. Um So we're a generation apart, but... Um, well, sort of two generations apart in schooling terms because it's sort of every five years, isn't it, really? But the thing mm. that strikes me about that is that from that school came some of the intellectuals of our time, called Paul Callahan, um, who wow. yep. predated me um, by about 10 years too, was the New Zealander of the Year, obviously. We've got the Callahan Institute or whatever it is named after him now. Um, he is one of New Zealand's leading scientists. Um, one of the leading lexographers of the world, uh, Birchfield, who wrote the uh, the revised Oxford English Dictionary, or at least was its editor, came out of those places. I mean, men and boys in those days had aspirations to achieve at the highest of academic levels. Um, you don't see that same aspiration in that particular school now, but here's the issue. And just to explain to listeners, it decided to turn itself back into co-ed because it was losing roll numbers, so it stopped being a boys' school, it became a co-ed school, lost the fight with the predominant high school of the time, um, which retained its leaders, and now has become, to all intents and purposes, oh, and I'm not going to um, uh, butter any parsnips on this one, um, it became a Maori school. Now, it's a failed school because, what, 80%, 85% of its population of that role are Maori, and they don't even achieve at the same level for Maori out New Zealand, and that's a much lower standard again. How do schools fail like that? And if they do fail, and Wanganui City College, as it's now called, not Wanganui Boys, used to be Wanganui Tech, um, is failing year after year after year at a standard, even if you took a socioeconomic decile and ethnic basis, how do those schools continue to exist 
without intervention from governments of the day and the Ministry of Education, when they're turning out kids, as you say, who, the majority of whom, have, if any education, they're not enough to be able to compete in the modern world? Um, well, it's, I, I guess it's beyond me, but uh, I, I think by and large, uh, the Ministry, etc., would look at it as a resource, as a resource thing uh, issue. Uh, the ministry tend to focus on uh, the network, you know, the amount of uh, bums on seats or um, and... But why don't, you just close, why don't they just close schools like that down? Just say you've oh, failed? I, I have no idea. Um, uh, but but even, even the sense that there is a, an intervention or a strong incentive to improve uh, doesn't appear to be there. Um, and, and okay, well, I'm gonna, okay, but I'm going to ask then the next question, Elwyn, and this is an honest yep. conversation. Is the reason that the ministry doesn't intervene in schools like that is because they are Māori? Because 85% of the role, 90% of the role is Māori, um, because the principal's Māori, and because um, they would be seen as, as culturally inappropriate to close a school like that down for its failure? That could be a part of their discussion, um, but there's a lot of schools that uh, you know, a long way down the achievement list that, that aren't Māori. Some of them are, are country schools, small town schools. As bad, um, as, as bad as Wanganui City College? Yeah. There are schools yeah, yeah. in New uh, Zealand that don't have a predominant Māori population that are turning out worse academic results than Wanganui City College. Yes. Wow. Not a lot, <laughs> uh, but they're <laughs> <laughs> Um... Yeah, but it, again, it's it, it's an adult perspective, isn't it? That that we don't see it as a problem for those children. Uh, it's, well, we would they go to school if that school closed? Well, well that, that they go to schools that are succeeding. I was just thinking, there's Wanganui High School <laughs> down the road. You know, they'd send and, and, them to Wanganui Girls College. Um, they yes, might send them or, to Kavanagh. Um, uh, yeah. You know, or or give Kavanagh, right? uh, a, a succeeding school. Yeah. Uh, the opportunity to that's, take over every and, and that's the other issue. Yes, you could say, right, all that you go now, you're going to have your school run by Wanganui Collegiate. And yeah. you contract Wanganui Collegiate to run Wanganui City College at that campus. Yeah? Yep. I think that, that those sort of plans are good plans. Um, and, and, you know, we have a problem with, with our South Auckland, with a, I help establish South Auckland Middle School, with the fact that their choice when they leave school uh, are four big co-eds, uh, Manyadawa High, James Cook High, Elfriston and Papakura, which isn't such a big school uh, anymore. If, frankly, that, that, that isn't a choice. I mean, they, they are four schools where there are good people in them, they're trying hard, uh, but it, the results aren't flat. You talked about Manakura College, which sort of runs as the outlier on Maori education. It's a predominantly Maori-based school, as I understand it. It's um, yeah. run with Maori values, um, uh, and and uh, but an expectation that children will succeed. Is that yeah. the kind of school that you would think could pick up the failed schools like Wanganui? Um, Flaxmere might be another one in Hawke's Bay, and and provide the leadership to. Um, so I get to speak uh, and be on the education panel at um, the New Zealand Economics Forum at Waikato in a few weeks' time. Mm. And so as a part of putting uh, a booklet together for that, uh, I got um, Nathan Gurin, who is uh, you know one of the founders and heads uh, at uh, Manukura, uh to... To, to see me something, and uh, again, his his the large thing that he will talk about is is the expectations that people uh, have for students, and in their case, for Maori students, and just how absolutely important uh, that is. And um, so, I I read you just a little bit because he he doesn't pull his punches. Okay. Um, he said, uh, in the area of Māori education or education for Māori, there needs to be greater support for iwi hapu led initiatives to design and deliver options for this cohort, and essentially not only for those students and whānau who are directly impacted, 
but also the capacity to create models uh, that um, so he is also involved in a group that is uh, restarting St. Stephen's School yeah. uh, so there is the ability for people to um, for I guess the success to be scaled up and, and the failures to be to be you know put, put away Yes, and again, there are, as you say, within the Māori community as well, successful schools, aspirational, demanding of their children um, and, and succeeding yep. at a practical level. You would hope that those were the models. Um, but you know the fascinating part of this discussion? Culture, culture, culture. That the schools that are succeeding best have a culture, an internal culture of their own, or at least the communities of which they serve have a culture. I hate to say this, I'm an Anglican. I'm not a very good Anglican, but I'm starting to think <laughs> that the agnostic, atheist, woke um, folk um, are struggling to produce any schools that have, um, with school teachers following those particular sensibilities, are struggling to produce any successful schools uh, or any, any successful educational outcomes. What's your response to that? Well, well also, in, in, in many of those uh that aren't doing particularly well, there's an amazing amount of role confusion in terms of what teachers ought to do. And I mean, I, I saw an article last year where a psychiatrist was saying how he wanted to teach um, teachers how to, um, you know, spot mental illness and things like that. That's not their job. Mm. And it's not what they're trained to do. Mm. Um, and there are all sorts of things get, that get slammed into those curriculum where the schools that succeed by and large Keep it simple. Now that doesn't mean that they're old-fashioned or luddites or anything like that. Um, but there's a real focus. Just another thing that Nathan actually wrote here that that it is, he said uh, we might be better served to place a microscope on successful models and promote these. The mm. data that you present highlights some trends. Mm. Sadly, those high-performing schools are a minority, mm. so the government will be obliged to manage the masses. Additionally, and I, I love this part, it serves the government's need to ensure we have fruit pickers and others to fill potholes in the road. So, mm. yeah. So, it's and it's straightforward. Right. So, his, yeah, well, so what Mason Jury is saying is that they want unskilled labour who have failed in the educational system, who will always be working for the minimum wage or not much above it, uh, because we've got those menial jobs in our community to do. Um, that would be a very yeah, cynical way of looking at the world, wouldn't it? Um, well, I guess he's one of the people who's out there changing it. Yeah. Um, and as I, as, as I said to a group that I spoke to uh, on, on Tuesday morning, uh, you know, a child that's leaving school, so 33% of Māori boys in South Auckland are leaving school without even level one NC. That is a scandal. Now, now you're going to go, uh, they will never be able to, pay rent for a good home, no. in all likelihood. Or ever buy a home. Uh, save, you know, save to buy a home, yeah. take an OE, yeah. um, provide provide for a family, mm. um, and and we, we need a New Zealand-wide aspiration for these kids mm. for the good of our country. Mm. No, you're not going to get an argument from me on that one or anybody else who's listening at the moment on that either. But the tragedy is... Well, I think if you had a Nathan, if you had a Nathan jury uh, in a leadership role in every school in New Zealand, there's a solution. Well, we have and them. I mean, Georgina Kingi would be another one from Haro Hohepa. Um, she must be in her 80s now, old Georgina. I don't know if she's left yet. But, I mean, there were Maori leaders, educational leaders, who have been aspirational for their children, for their students, for a long, long time. They seem to have been put to one side. Even those conservative Maori leaders, and Georgina would be in that category, um, for this new agenda. And God knows what it's producing. Can I just also say to you, Alan, the work that you're doing is critical um, to provide an independent, um, if you like, observation uh, and analysis. Or it's work that I would have expected that the Ministry of Education was doing every year learning the lessons from and seeking to um, upraise standards. And I see none of that and have seen none of it now this century. It's just so depressing. Oh, I, I agree. And even even some of the mechanisms now with what they're calling their curriculum refreshed, 
Um, we don't necessarily need a curriculum refresh in New Zealand. I think we need a curriculum simplification. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things I and a group of people I'm working with are, are pushing for is, is that, you know, we do much, much better for parents and, and information and resourcing for those first five years. Um, because in some cases, you know, you are getting kids to school who are in no way prepared. Um, and then you've got teachers who don't really know what to do with them. Um, so there's a lot that could be done and a lot that could be led very well from the ministry, but they're missing in action. They are indeed. Uh, but you are, thank God, and thank you so much for raising this issue again. Um, it's not going to go away, but we intend to keep that pressure on. Elwyn, you're doing God's work. Well done, mate. Um, all right, that is Elwyn Paul.